I've been told that this would probably be a good place to start. Am I right? I'm getting, uh, uh, from what I understand, a few of you have had some problems with the first problem on the homework. I take it this is something, I guess y'all weren't, did you? Well, we only have class Tuesday, Thursday, so it's Monday night. <laughs> I know things. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to walk you. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some things regarding problem one. This problem heavily relies on your mechanics of deformable bodies notes. So if it's or, or experience, so if it's been a while, or whatnot, um, no big deal. I think you will find when we break it down, this problem isn't so bad. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Let's let's settle down. Okay. So first off, let me walk you through a couple things. So we have in this problem, we've got a cylinder, um, maybe something like this, a cylinder that is being subjected, you know, to some load, okay? And we'll say that that cylinder is on, you know, some surface, I don't know. So obviously, you know, statics and structures tell you, you know, it's reacting the other way, okay? Now let, let's start writing down some information from the problem that we know. Okay, so right off the bat we know that the diameter, and I'm going to call this the original diameter because it's loaded and after loading it deforms. So the original diameter is what, six inches? Okay, so do I need to walk through this? You all can compute the area, right? Okay. Now, it is subjected to a load, right? That load is, what, uh, 150 kips, right? So if the load that is applied is 150 kips, and you have the area, you should then be able to calculate the stress or the pressure, which is P over A, right? Everybody okay with that? Okay, now, okay, let's look at, let's, let's keep going through this. So we've been given in the problem a modulus of elasticity, right? A Young's modulus. Now remember, Young's modulus is that relationship between how much stress that is applied and your resulting strain, assuming it's, it's linear. So if we know that the Young's modulus, E, is what? What is it? 8,000, okay? If this is 8,000 KSI, and we also know that stress is related to strain by, you know, Young's modulus, we should be able to solve for the strain, right? Everybody okay with that? Now, one last thing, how long is this cylinder? What's that? One foot or, or 12 inches. And I'm, I'm going to call this the initial length. Um, and this is 12 inches, okay? Now, if we know the initial length, and we know that the strain is defined as the change in length over the original length, we should be able to determine delta. Does, does that make sense? You, is everybody okay with that? You, well, all right. Let's, let's look at this, okay? Here's our original length right here, right? And this we get from right there. So if we know the strain and we know the length, we can determine delta. So just the strain times the length. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, when you compute this, I don't, don't hold me to the number because I, I really just don't remember, but you're probably going to get something like a, uh, like a tenth of an inch, like 0.1 inch or 0.2 inches or something like that. That's how much the length changes. Okay. The problem asked for the final length. Okay. Let me ask a question. This cylinder, okay, originally, before the load is applied, this is 12 inches, okay? Now, uh, uh, let's just keep this basic. If I take this cylinder and I do that, is the cylinder going to get shorter or is it going to get longer? Shorter, okay? So, let's say we compute delta. Don't, don't, you know, don't be married to these numbers because I really don't remember them. But let's say delta is 0 0.1 inches. Okay? Think about it. If this was originally 12 inches and it changed that much, what's its final length? 
11.9. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? That's generally the long and short of that first part. Okay? Now here's the second part. Okay? You were given one other value in the problem. What was that? The Poisson's ratio. And Poisson's ratio is what? 0 0.35. Okay. Now, let's keep that in the back of our heads, but I want to ask uh, another question. I think it'd be easier if we assumed that this cylinder was made out of something like, I don't know, Play-Doh or something like that. If I took a thing of Play-Doh, all right, and I squish it like that, it gets shorter. What else does, happens? It gets, get, get grows, right? This is the ratio of the depth of the strain this way to the strain that way. That's what that number is. Okay? So here's what I propose. Okay? This strain value right here, that's going to be the longitudinal strain. In other words, how much strain we get this way, right? If you take that value and multiply it by, by Poisson's ratio, you will get the strain laterally. Okay? Yes, yes. All right. Now, now, bless you. Now, I, I haven't said anything about signs. If you look at the notes, you'll see there's a sign here. But the negative sign is really to reflect common sense. In other words, looking at this element, if I push on it, the length decreases, or the strain decreases, gets smaller in one direction, but it gets larger in another. So it's flipped. The directions are flipped. Does that make sense? So there was a hint on the problem. The cylinder is going to get shorter, but what's going to happen to the diameter? It's going to get larger. Does that make sense? So if I've got this lateral strain, so watch this. So if I've got lateral strain, would you agree with this, that the lateral strain is going to equal essentially a change in length over the original length, but we're talking about the original length this way. What is the original length this way? It's, it's the diameter, right? So then we can take that and say, well, the final diameter is the initial diam diameter plus whatever this value is. And let's be clear, this value of delta is not going to be the same as what's up here, or as what's up there. Does that make sense? Does that clear that problem up a little bit? Yes? Um, can you use the delta equals PL over EA, please? You could. You could. I'm just tr trying to walk you through it slowly. You could do that. But, um, but let me also say that if you use delta equals PL over EA, that'll just give you the delta. You will still need the strain to do this. Not for deflections, because it's a different length. It's 12 inches long this way, it's 6 inches long that way. So it's, it's not going to work out. That's a good question, though. Now, if it was a cube, you know, it was all the same, then yeah. So, Does that make sense? Does that, is everybody okay with that? While, I'm, while we're on the topic, are there any other questions about the homework? I don't want to take too much time, uh, because we do have some stuff we need to talk about. But uh, I'm willing to take a few more minutes if you all need. Can you just go into what a 1.13 plus is talking about? You don't really have to go to this one. That, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so uh, let me say this. If, if I had started explaining 1.13 before I had talked about this, I have, I have a feeling that 1.13 would have been even more confusing. So I'm glad I'm talking about 1.13 now, now that we got this out of the way. Mathematically, I think this one is far more challenging than 1.13. Okay, so let me explain what's going on with 1.13. Okay, so you've been given a series of materials in 1.13. No matter what material, the geometry is going to be the same. You're going to have a cylindrical rod that's going to have a length of 380 millimeters and a diameter of 10 millimeters, and it's going to be subjected to a tensile load. It's going to be yanked on. Okay, make sense? Okay. So first off, it's a cylindrical rod, so if you know the diameter, you should be able to compute the area, 
and you've got the length, so you, you know, given material properties, you should be able to get stresses and strains and all of that. Everybody okay with that? Right, again, the, the formulas don't really change. It's still sigma equals P over A, and it's still change in length over the original length. Is everybody okay with that? So, so the idea is this. For each one of these materials, so, so think about it like this. For each one of these materials, you're going to have a different E value, so a different elastic modulus. You should be able to take each one of these materials and compute what's the stress, what's the deformation, et cetera. Okay? The problem is asking which of the four materials are possible candidates for the following application. And in this application, what's going to happen? Um, in this application, the load is going to be 24.5 kilonewtons, so P is going to be 24.5 kilonewtons, and the length can't increase more than 0.9 millimeters. So when you compute this delta value, it can't be higher than 0.9. So for each one of these materials, you could use delta equals PL over EA, or you could go through this process, what have you. Um, and for any one of them where, where delta is larger than 0.9, well, that material wouldn't work. Do you see what I mean? So, so that's going to be one caveat. The other caveat is that the, the rod must not experience plastic deformation. Okay? Now let's go back to our material behavior. Remember, materials behave plastically when their stress gets larger than what? My, I know my, my deformables and my, and my steel and concrete folks know this. The yield stress. Okay? So if you compute P over A, and that P over A is larger than the yield strength than you see right here, then that material is no good either. The material has to remain elastic, so it's got to be less than that yield strength, and it has to have a deformation less than 0.9. So the idea is to go through copper, aluminum, steel, and brass and figure out of these four materials, do any of them work? Do all of them work? Do only some of them work? But that's kind of the idea. But the math is the same. Does that make sense? Does that clear that up for everybody else? I am. I am. Hit that subscribe button. No. <laughs> I've got jokes. I'm t they're just going to keep rolling. Although you're probably going to hear the same jokes over and over again, especially considering you all have me so much this semester. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> no. Well, I've only been here. I've only been here four years, or this is my fourth year. So, and I didn't record anything like my first year here. So, um, but yeah. Um, any other homework-related questions, though? Okay. All right. Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. Okay, l let me go through some real brief announcements, and then we gotta, um, we got to cover some stuff with aggregates, especially considering our lab uh, today. So, first off, just so everybody remembers, homework one is due on Tuesday, beginning of class. We'll start a pile right up here, and um, we'll get the sign-in sheet passed around, and uh, uh, we'll collect that right at the very beginning. Um, I'm not going to do this every day, but I went ahead and uploaded the attendance grades on Blackboard. Uh, and I'll do that periodically, like a few times here and there throughout the semester, just so you all have a general idea of where you're at on attendance. Now, there are no homework grades, and there are no uh, exam grades yet. So if you happen to miss a day and you see, like, oh, no, I've got a 60, well, we've only met three times. So don't worry. It's not that big of a deal. Um, one thing I will point out, um, for the next couple of lectures, probably for the, uh, for the next uh, couple labs and at least the next homework, there's going to be a, a pretty extensive use of these, which are called gradation charts. These are, are very uh, fundamental tools that you need to perform a sieve analysis, which is what we're going to talk about today uh, for a given aggregate. Now, I've got copies, uh, one copy for everybody in here for the exercise that we're going to do in class today. But um, between now and when we finish with aggregates, I mean, you're going to need one today for your lab. You're probably going to need one for an upcoming homework assignment and whatnot. I just decided to do this. I have a green cart outside my office. Um, the top shelf is for anything that I distribute for instructional analysis. The bottom is for this class. And I printed off a boatload of them, so you all should be able to come and just grab what you need. I mean, don't go there and just grab 20 of them. I mean, you, you aren't going to need that many. But you'll probably need 
maybe th three or four of them, you know, here and there between now and when it's all said and done. So I'll try and keep, uh, keep copies out there uh, just so everybody has them. Speaking of, I'm going to go ahead and distribute these now. This is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give you those and you all can sort of work them around. Um, any questions? Okay, so uh, today what we're going to do uh, is go through a typical sieve analysis uh, for a, a particular uh, a sample or a regular set of data uh, for an aggregate. And uh, I think the easiest way to explain the motivation as to, uh, to why this is important is really to look at this. So I have here a jar with me, and this jar contains some sand or fine aggregates. Specifically, this is representative of uh, uh, a lot of the samples that we're going to be looking at in lab today. I'm going to pass this around, but one of the things I really want to point out is just take the jar and sort of roll it and look at the, uh, the surface of the aggregate. And if you actually take a look at it, it's pretty easy to see that the particles are not all the same size. You've got some big particles, some small, small particles, uh, somewhere, this particle somewhere in between. What we need to understand about this particular aggregate is the distribution of size. How many big particles do we have? How many small particles do we have? And the reason why is because we're planning on using this aggregate, for instance, for use in, in mixtures with things like concrete. So, you know, we need to understand things like its gradation or the particle size distribution. We're going to need to know its moisture content. I pulled this sample directly from the main bin. So, um, would it be fair to say that this sample is dry? No. Okay. I propose that this sample is air dry. Okay. The difference is a dried sample is one that's been in the oven and cured to remove all, this particular, all that particular moisture. This is air dry. I guarantee you there's some residual moisture in here. That's going to be one of the focuses of our lab today as well, is given a sample of unknown moisture content, how do you determine that moisture content? So that's going to be one of the things that we look at today. So I'm going to give that to you. Go ahead and just pass that around, take a look at it. And uh, that's, what we're going to, uh, that's what we're going to focus on today. Now, hold on. There we go. Okay, so like I said, um, coarse aggregates, aggregates retain on the number four sieve. Fine aggregate is what passes the number four sieve. But really, what we're interested in is gradation. In other words, particle size distribution through a series of sieves. Now, ultimately, we'll plot that on a, a semi-log gradation plot that looks something like this. You all have, uh, or should, uh, the plot should be going around. Uh, you should have a distribution plot that looks something like this. So the idea is if you're looking at a plot, um, anything that's to the right of the uh, number four would be indicative of a gravel type of aggregate. Anything to the right in the central region would be a sand. Um, yes? You need one more of the grain size distribution. Let me see if I brought some. I thought I had printed off enough. Uh, where'd my bag go? You got them? Hey, now. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm really not, though. Um, <laughs> um, so I guess anything that, that, uh, that uh, passes the number four sieve is going to be listed as, as a sand. If you look here on the y-axis on the left, this will give you kind of an idea of what we're looking at. What you're seeing is the percent passing a given sieve. So the way these charts will work is you'll always start at the top at like 100 and you'll start going down. So maybe most of the uh, material passes the number four sieve, like if we're talking about a sand. You know, all of it will pass, let's say, the number four. Most of it will pass the number four. Then maybe only, I don't know, 80% passes the number 20. Maybe only 70% passes the number 30. And, the, and as the sieves get tinier and tinier, remember, as the sieve number goes up, the size of the opening gets smaller, you will see that this starts to trail down. Now, anything past the number 200 sieve, and you'll, uh, you, can, you can't even really see the openings in, in a number two sieve. I mean, uh, in that uh, region, we're talking about some really, really fine particulate materials. And really, we're getting into the world of things like silts or clays. Clay particles are incredibly small, so that, that would be uh, that world as well. Now, um, 
just by observation, looking at that, um, that jar, and uh, I'm picking on the folks that have already taken a look at it, um, but I want to look at uh, typical gradations and what we're not after, what we're really, really not after in a particular material is one that is uniformly graded. And uniformly graded uh, uh, material is one where all the particles are the same size. Is that the case on this? No, we've got big particles, small particles, and what have you. That's what we're after. We're after what's called a well-graded soil. Where we've got our well-graded aggregate. And, and let me sort of explain why, okay? Let's say I have a jar, okay? Now, a uniformly graded uh, aggregate or uniformly graded material where all the particles are the same size would fill that space something like this. And I'm going to use really big particles to kind of make my point. But you'll have a particle like this, maybe a particle like this, maybe another one goes like that, maybe another one goes like that, and like that. Keep in mind, the particles are the same size. Now, what's the problem? The problem is there's a lot of void space there, a lot of empty space. It doesn't create a good base, and it doesn't create a good filler for uh, uh, something like a concrete. It doesn't really perform that well. What we want is a well-graded material. We want big particles, but we also want some medium-sized particles. We want some medium-sized particles in there. And then we'll also want maybe some small particles. Maybe we want some really small particles. By having particles of a different size distribution, it fills that particular volume in that particular space much more efficiently. It reduces the voids. You know, think if you're talking about a, a concrete. Let's talk about concrete. You know, we're talking about a, this material being introduced as an ingredient into concrete. Well, how much strength do you think air contributes to concrete? Not much, you know. You got to fill that space up with either aggregate or some cement and water, things like that. So a well-graded aggregate is definitely uh, what we're going to be after. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you can definitely identify what's going on uh, on a uh, uh, for a particular um, type of aggregate by looking at its gradation plot by looking at one of these. Um, if you see, and I, I want to point to the uniformly graded one. Uh, a uniformly graded uh, aggregate, when you plot it out, it's really going to kind of look like this. And I've got one here, but I almost want to draw it a little more dramatically. It's going to sort of do this, and then, whew, then it's going to do something like that. Because think, as you move along this axis, okay, you're looking at different sieve sizes. Notice how there's a big drop, right? See how there's a big drop? What that means is if all the aggregate particles are essentially the same size, what's happening is, okay, they're all, let's say they're all passing the number four, they're all passing the number eight, the number 10, but let's say you get to the 16 and they're all retained on the 16. What that means is all those particles are essentially, the, for the most part, the same size because they're all being retained on that one same sieve. Does that make sense? What you, what you really want, what you're really after, is one that's a little more gradual, where a little bit's retained here, a little bit's retained there, a little bit's retained there, and you can see that distribution going down. Th does that make sense? Okay, so that's the difference between a well-graded uh, aggregate and a uniformly graded aggregate. A gap-graded aggregate is one where you might have, you know, a bunch of big particles and a bunch of small particles, but not really much in between. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Again, if you've got any questions, please, you know, please uh, throw them out there. Right here, I'll just leave that there. Okay. So let's talk about a, uh, a sieve analysis. So what I've got here is a nest of sieves. If you've done any type of material testing stuff over the summer with some internship, maybe with the DOH or some contractor, you've probably seen this stuff before. So, this, so what happens is you'll see that I, uh, uh, well, last time I remember I brought in that that's a couple of sieves and we pass that around. Um, what you'll do is you'll stack a series of sieves in what's called a nest. So now your nest, first off, your nest will change if you're looking at a coarse aggregate or a fine aggregate. You really don't need one inch diameter openings for a sand, you know. For a sand, you're looking at number fours, number eight, or number tens, number twenties, number forties. You know, here are the 
typical sizes. And I'll be frank with you, we're probably going to mix this up a little bit because I want you to be more uh, attentive in lab. You know, we might not use a number four, number 10, number 20. Maybe it's a number four, number eight, number 16. I want you to go through your nest and actually write the sieve sizes down. I want you to make sure that you're, you're documenting all this throughout the test. <coughs> so we'll stack a, a nest up. You know, we close it up up top. Make sure the very bottom of it has a pan. You, know, you don't want to have an empty sieve on the bottom. You have, to ha you have to have a pan to retain what's left over. Okay? So you'll close all that up, put that on the top, um, and then you begin your, uh, uh, your, your sieve uh, analysis. Now, I remember when I was uh, uh, in undergrad, we actually didn't use the, uh, the sieve shaker. We sort of did it by hand, you know, did, give it the old shake a shake the old tapa tapa, you know, something like that. Uh, in, in lab today, we're going to use a, an automated uh, sieve shaker that will actually agitate the sample uh, according to spec. But what we're going to do is we're going to obtain a dry weight of the sample. So the sample that we're going to use in lab has already been oven dried, so it's already been taken care of. Um, <coughs> we're going to record the individual weight of the pan and of each individual sieve. So we need the weight of the sieve by itself. Then we place the sample on the top of the nest, close it up, put it in the shaker, let it agitate. Then we go back and we weigh each individual sieve and then perform our calculations. Okay, pretty straightforward procedure. Okay, now let me also, you know, let me make this clear. Okay, let's make up a number. Let's say you uh, start off with 500 grams of material. Okay, and then you go through and do all the the calcs. So you weigh each sieve uh, before and after materials in it to get the weight of the material in each sieve, and you add that up, and it's not 500 grams. It's like 495 grams, or it's 505 grams, or, or something like that. And you go, well, what the heck? Did we lose material? Did we, did we violate the law of conservation of matter, that matter cannot be created or destroyed? Did we, um, did we start doing some particle physics and whatnot in here? No. Um, let's be clear. There are, some, some, uh, there are a number of potential sources of error when performing these types of calculations. I mean, when, you know, you could have material caught in the sieve bef before the uh, test was begun. Maybe, maybe the sieve wasn't washed properly beforehand. I mean, you can imagine if I took that sample that was passed around in that jar and I just sort of dumped it on the table, you could almost imagine some of that dust, that dust flume. Well, that dust is material that has weight with it, okay? So we could lose material and dust. Um, rounding. I mean, our scale is only accurate to, I believe, you know, the tenth of a gram. You know, there's, there might be issues uh, with rounding. Uh, you might use, diff uh, we're going to do our best to avoid this, but, you know, different scales used, you know, spillage, recording errors. So it's very, you know, there are, um, there, there's always going to be some error or, you know, potentially present. Um, the long and short of it is, is if your error is less than 2%, you know, comparing your uh, initial weight and your final weight, if you're within 2%, uh, you're fine. And, that, and what I mean by that is the difference between the sample weight at the very beginning and summing up all that's been retained on your sieves uh, at the end. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So let's take a look at this. I want to um, go through a particular sieve analysis with you all together. Okay? So what we've got here is a, uh, some data that was retained from a, let's say, a sieve analysis in the lab. So we've got sieve numbers that are listed and masses that are retained on the sieve. So think about what's already been done. The sieves were weighed empty, and the sieves were weighed full, and then the difference was taken. Okay? So let's, let's be clear about that. So that's already been done. And what we've got is the mass that's been retained on the, uh, on the sieve. Okay? So let's go through the, the, the calculations, and let's go through the plotting of how we would ultimately take that data and come up with this. And by this, this is what I mean, a, uh, a semi-log gradation plot for this particular sample. Make sense? Well, we're, we're gonna, we gotta do some calcs first to, to actually get the numbers that we need to plot. You're not just gonna plot these numbers directly, okay? Everybody with me on that? All right, so let, let's take a, a, a moment off the side, which this isn't structural analysis, so there's no pun there. Okay. All right. So 
don't worry, I'll, I'll rewrite this data. So. Now, before I start writing the, 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 um, the table out, let's read the example a, a little more carefully. So we're going to determine the percent liner passing each step and plot the green size distribution. So we've been given a sand sample that weighed 620 grams, and here's the following result. So this is what happened. Or we weighed the sample at the very beginning and got 620 grams, and this is the mass that we got on each individual sieve. So let, let's, let's go through this a little bit. Let's see what we get. So let's, look, uh, let's draw ourselves out a little table. So I'll say, let me put up here, original weight was 620 grams. Okay, so sieve size. Okay, now your sieve size that was given was, um, let's see, what you got a, a number four, a number eight, or no, number ten. Let me, oops. you got a number twenty, you got a number 40, a number 60, a number 100, you move out of the way, and a number 200. I'm trying to leave a little bit of a gap between those so that you all can see what number goes with which sip. Okay, now the mass retained. Okay. So we've got 28 grams, 42 grams, 48, 128, 221, 86, 40, oh, and I forgot one. I forgot the pan. This was 24. Okay. All right. So right off the bat, one of the things I noticed about these mass retains is that they're reported to the nearest gram. So if they were reported maybe to the nearest tenth of a gram, if there's any error, maybe that right off the bat could have reduced some of the error that we're about to see. The first thing I want you all to do is I want you to sum this up. What do we get? 617. I would ask for a second, but I heard a bunch of people say that. So we did lose some material throughout this process. Again, rounding, dust, spillage, what have you. It could have been a number of different things. Very common. Is that acceptable? Okay. Well, let's look at this. So how much did we lose? What's that? Three grams. Okay. The original weight was 620 grams, right? So therefore, our percent loss was essentially 3 over 620, which is what? Take that and also multiply it by 100 so we get a percentage. 0.48%. Do I have a second on that? Is that acceptable? Yeah, it's less than 2%. We're good. We're, we're, we're way good. It's not 48%. It, yeah. Yeah, that would be way bad. If you do that, just do the test again. And that, that basically means that like you're walking and the whole thing spilled and you're like, I'll just weigh it anyways and be fine. <laughs> yeah, I'll be all right. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Okay, so here's the mass uh, retained. Okay, now here's the mass retained. Now, the percent retained. Okay. The percent retained. So ultimately, the total amount that passed through our sieves was 617. Okay. Now let's take the number four sieve. 28 grams passed through the number four sieve, right? 28 grams passed through the number uh, four sieve. What? Oh, yeah, retain. Sorry, retain. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. You're right. You are right. One out of seven. Okay. 
who said it was. All right, so 28 grams were retained on the number four sieve. Now, there's 617 grams total. I'm using the actual mass that was in each sieve. So 28 out of 617, what's that percentage? Let's, let's, let's add a little more specificity. Let's go two decimals. So 4.54, okay. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say 28 over 617, and I'm going to say that that is 4.54%, okay? Do I, do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. Okay, so you, so you see how I'm doing this? So the next one would be 42 over 617. What do we got there? 6.81. Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. So let's go down. Let's just, I, I'm not going to write the formula out for each one. Let's just keep going and let's, let's start writing them down. So the number 20 said, what do we got? 7.78. All right, um, the, uh, the number 40. Twenty point seven five. All right, next one. Thirty five point eight two. I want everybody else doing these as well. So if, if there's a, a hiccup, let me know. All right, so a hundred. 13.94, all right, the number 200, all right, and then the pan, 1.5. Okay, all right. Is everybody okay with those values? Here's a real quick check. Take those numbers, add them up. This is one of those things that works really well in Excel, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Hundred point zero. I'm actually gonna write that. I'm gonna write hundred point zero one to recognize that that's an, you know, think, that's an, technically an error, you know, if we're talking about rounding, okay? It's just something to think about, so. I mean, this is just pure math. Theoretically, this should come out to be 100%. So if we're getting a difference here, just rounding this to two decimal places on a percentage, what do you think we can get in the lab? It's possible, so it's just something to think about. Everybody good so far? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a cumulative percent return or percent retained. And, and let, let me explain what that means. Okay, so a cumulative percent retained, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the list and start asking, well, what was retained on all the sieves? So here's kind of the idea. I'm gonna start off by writing just the 4.54% right here. So. 4.54% was retained on the number four. Everybody's okay with that, right? Now do me a favor, add up 4.54 and 6.81 and tell me what you get. 13, thir oh, yeah, 11.35. Okay, now here's what I'm getting at. 4.54% was retained on the number four. I propose that 11.35% was retained on the number four and the number 10. Does that make sense? Okay, how about uh, the number four, number 10, and number 20? What would this value be right here? 19.13. Does this make sense? Okay, what about the next one? 39.88. Okay, let's keep going. 75.70, is that what you said? Keep going. 89.64. All right, 
keep going. 96.12 and, and 100.01. There's another check for you that it matches right there. Make sense? So, so think about what we're doing. As we're going down, we're re recording percent retained. Okay, so this is the percent that was retained on the number four, the percent that was retained on both the number four and the number 10, the percent that was retained on the number four, 10, and 20, cumulatively as we go down. Does that make sense? Well, if that makes sense, then the question is this. How much, and this is why I was getting ahead of myself, let's look at percent passing. Man, it's like the upper right portion of this screen, the pen gets a little sketchy. Okay, all right, think about, all right, let's, just, let's just use our noggins here. If 4.54% 4 4 was retained on the number four SID, 4.5% 4 retained on the number four, how much passed the number four? 100 minus that, okay? So what's 100 minus this? That's a good. Um, we, that's actually a good point. We could use 100 or 100.1 or 0 .01. I don't know that it really matters. And just to keep things simple, I'm just going to go with 100. So technically, you know, yeah, we, we would get a negative value. But let's also be clear: this error is solely due to rounding. Like if we were doing this in Excel, that, that wouldn't even show up. So, so what'd you say? 95.95.46. Okay. Now think. This is the amount that was retained on both the number four and the number ten. So how much passed below that? A hundred minus that. So 88.65. Does everybody see how we're doing that? We're literally just taking a hundred minus 4.54. A hundred minus 11.35. This is going to be 100 minus 19.13. 100 minus 39.88. 100 minus 75.70. 100 ooh, minus 89.64. 100 minus 96.12. So, yeah, technically this would be 100 minus 100. 0 0.01. But again, the only reason for that difference is just our rounding. So usually I won't even write a number down here. I'll just put you know, something like that just to say it's, it's zero. So let's start filling these values in. Let's see what we get. Okay, so uh, 88.65. What's the next one? 80.87. Next one? 60.12. We're getting here. 24.30. Next one. 10.36. And then the last one. 3.88%. So think, that cumulative percent retained is saying as we go down the sieve, how much was retained above that particular sieve? So the percent passing is just 100 off of that, how much passed. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, straight edges. Remember this? All right. So I want to give you all a, a, a second, and I, I want you all to go through this. So you can start at the number four and just say, you know, here's the number four, and sort of locate that on there and then start plotting. So I'm going to give you all a, a second and, and fill that out. I want you all to do that on your own. I want to see what you come up with. If you all do any material testing or sieve analyses over the summer, this might be something that you have to do. Is this something, did you have to do this for your sieve analyses? Did you have to fill these out? Did you, did you fill these out over the summer? Uh, I didn't push any losses, no. But you did, did you do these? So, so next step.
Well, if you go back now, you'll know how to do the, the paperwork and know how to do the stuff on the other end. Hey. That's the stuff you want to step up and do so that you have that on your resume. Oh my goodness. Just so you all are aware, it's just a tidbit, little food for thought. This particular grain size distribution graph is not something that I created or, or something that is really a, a, a secret. This is actually a public document. It's actually made by the Department of Defense. So if you notice on the bottom where it says DD Form 1207, that's what the DD stands for. So the more you know. And so remember, just so everybody's clear, you're plotting this column over here, the percent passing. Yes, sir. That's a good question. What for now? Leave it blank. Like just start at the number four and work your way down, and I'll show you what what we did here and what you'll see in uh, in lab. So. In lab, I think I think what we have is is our first sieve is a three eighths sieve, so that when you pour, you know that everything's going to pass through the three eighths. So your number one hundred would start there. Did you see what I mean? I didn't include that here just because. It didn't really matter. But if we did, what would happen is you'd have the, your, your line above the number four. It'd say something like 3 eighths inch sieve. It'd have no mass retained, no percent retained, no cumulative percent retained, and then percent passing would be 100, and you'd start there. So I actually have that line drawn on mine, and, and you'll see that here in a second. See, I told you all you would need a straight edge today. What's that? Yeah, but, because, but that's, a, that's actually an interesting point, because technically we're looking at something that's probably more in a curved nature. However, um, I'll talk about that here in a second, because ultimately what you would do is you would plot this against the range for a given specification, and if it failed, ultimately what you'd have to do is blend two aggregates together, and essentially what you're doing is linearly interpolating in that anyway. So. But you'll see that as, as we get to it. There's sort of a graphical approach to blending. We might actually get to talking about it today. I'm not sure, so we'll, we'll see. For, yeah. right, is everybody good? Do you all need a couple more minutes? OK, all right. Um, let me see something. Uh, OK, so this is mine, and I wanted to pull this up. You should have a curve that looks something about like this. Um, might be changed up a little bit uh, depending upon your, your estimation. Now what I did is I assumed that on top of my number four sieve, I had three eighths inch sieve and everything passed through it. So 100% passed through that one and that's where that started. And then you can see the number four is about 95, the number 10 is about uh, 87, 88, and you can see how, how I'm going about that. Is everybody okay with that? You're going to have to do a few of these uh, between your laboratory data and some homework problems and whatnot. So that's why I said I've got a few of these charts on the card outside my office because, I mean, between homeworks and whatnot, I figured it would be easier to just have a whole bunch of them and you all can just pick them up whenever you need. Does that sound good? Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, it, it, let's talk about that. Let, let's talk about that. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to skip ahead in the notes a little bit because I ultimately want you all to see the end product. I am going to take a moment and talk a little bit about the fineness modulus, and we'll go back and do that calculation uh, here in a second. Um, but let, let me give you kind of an idea. So I skipped ahead a little bit in the notes to give you kind of an idea. So here's the reason why we're doing this. Okay, so I'm just curious. So that jar of aggregate that you see right there, that jar of aggregate is ultimately going to be used as an ingredient for a material like concrete. Okay? Now, concrete uh, has typically four main ingredients. It has water, it has Portland cement, it has gravel or coarse aggregate, and then sand or fine aggregate. But, but it's not as simple as that, just say, I'll throw some sand in there. What, what do you mean? Well, the sand has to meet certain specifications. So here's an example of the specifications uh, that a fine aggregate must meet uh, in order to be used for a concrete mix. So if we're talking about the number four sieve, 95 to 100% must pass that given sieve. If we're talking about the number 16, anywhere from 50 to 85% must pass that sieve. So the idea is if you were looking at a, 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 a grain size distribution chart, something like this, like let's take the number 16, 50 to 85. So here's the number 16. It's gotta be somewhere between 50 and 85. Does everybody see that? So the blue is, is the range. In other words, if I'm using a sand, it must meet that requirement. It must meet that requirement uh, for us to use uh, in a given aggregate. Now the question comes, well, what happens if it fails? What happens if the sand falls outside this given range? Well, by itself, you would not be able to use that fine aggregate, or you shouldn't use that fine aggregate uh, for your given mix. But what you could do is, let, let's say it fell outside the range because the aggregate was, quote unquote, too big. Okay? Well, what you do is then take another uh, portion of aggregate that's, quote unquote, too small, take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and mix it. Now you've got an aggregate that meets specifications. It's called aggregate blending. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so I want you to sort of see the end product, the end result, why we're doing all this. Grain size distribution is one of the most fundamental quality control uh, parameters that we need to assess when we use this uh, material uh, in, in mixes like asphalts and concretes. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? Now, I want to go a little bit off, uh, off of a tangent. I want to um, uh, show you a calculation for a really simple uh, how to compute what's called a fineness modulus. A fineness modulus is, is really just a measure of the relative uh, fineness or coarseness of some type of fine aggregate, and it's used for daily quality control for concrete mixes, because usually you want to keep a range between like 2.3 and 3.1 uh, for a given fine aggregate. Uh, it's, uh, it's really simple to calculate. I just want to show you all how to do this. But the long and short of it is you're essentially summing up the cumulative percent retained uh, for a given uh, 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 sieve analysis and dividing that by 100 to, a, to get a numerical uh, value. It's a pretty basic, straightforward calculation, but I wanted you all to see how this, uh, how this works. So I've got here uh, another set of sieve data. I've got a different set of sieve data. Is you could, um, uh, I'm going to show you how to do this on this set of data. And you've got example three, you could do it again uh, on a different set of days. So it gives you more room, more flexibility to do some, uh, some calcs on. <coughs> now, I've got here uh, a sieve stack. Now notice here I've got that, um, that 3 8 inch sieve on the top, and I've got here where everything passed through the, uh, uh, the number, uh, the, the, the 3 8 inch. So we are definitely dealing uh, with, quote unquote, a, a, a fine aggregate. So, Everything passed, so, so cumulative percent retained, this means everything passed through the number three eighths. We could take this data where we've got percent retained and cumulative uh, percent retained. We could take this and convert it into percent passing, just take 100 minus each of these and do another civ, uh, a green size distribution. What I want to do is a, um, a, 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 a fineness modules calculation, and it's pretty straightforward. It's really simple. I don't even need to bring up another, uh, another notebook. All you need to do essentially is sum up this particular column. So what is uh, 4 plus 19 plus 39 plus 60 plus da, 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 da. Just sum that up. Tell me what you get. Two hundred ninety-seven. Uh, second on that? Second on that. All right. So 297. 
So therefore, your finest modulus is 2.97. That's pretty, that's pretty simple. I just wanted you uh, to be exposed to that in case you see it later, you know, for concrete mixes uh, and the like. Again, it's just a quality uh, assurance measurement uh, that you might see later on. So to relate it to what we just did, um, let me pull up this. So we would essentially be summing up um, our cumulative percent retained. So we'd essentially be summing up uh, this column right here. Actually, let me go up here. We'd be summing up this column, the cumulative percent retained column, except for the the um, the pan, except for the pan. What's that? That's a good question. It depends on, um, and I'm gonna get. What's that? It de it ultimately, it depends on the ASTM standard that you're using, which we're going to look at some ASTM standards later on. We're, we're essentially, we're going to be following ASTM C136, which is the standard test method for sieve analyses. What I've, what I've decided to do is this. I want us to go ahead, I, I'll get to you in a second. What, what I want us to do uh, in here, and this is sort of a, a strategy that I thought would make a little more sense. I want us to go ahead and do the test. And then take, go back and look at the standard. Because sometimes the standards can be written, I mean, they're written in fairly technical language. And I'm afraid the first time you see them, they might be a little, quote unquote, intimidating. So I wanted to wait and show you them after we've done the testing. Oh, OK, and it's, it's not so bad. But essentially, if you're looking at a coarse aggregate, the sieve sizes are pretty much laid out for you, as well as for a fine aggregate. Now, now like I said, I'm probably, you're probably going to get mixed up a little bit uh, in lab. instead of following this to the letter, we might mix it up because we want you to actually pay attention to what you're doing in the lab, you know, so that you're looking at the NIST, okay, that's a number four, or oh, that's a number eight, it's not a number 10, oh, that's a number 30, that's not a number 50, uh, or what have you. But essentially, what dictates what size, it's off the standard. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes. It's, it's essentially a quality assurance uh, measurement for the, the, the relative fineness of, of a given sample. And it's a quality assurance measurement that we, we might see later when we're looking at concrete mixes. It's just a parameter uh, that's probably going to show up later on. And I don't want to delve too deeply into it because when we start, let, let me put it like this. Right now, I just want to make sure you understand how to compute it. Later on, when we start getting into things like proportioning concrete mixes, it's one of those things where when you see it, you go, oh, okay, now I see it. Because I don't want, um, because if I had to, if I waited and showed you then, I just, it's one of those things, I want to get all that stuff like fineness uh, modules, water contents. I want those fundamental calcs to already be in the back of your head so that when we see mix design, it's not so bad. So, all right. Does that make sense? Yes. So on that fineness modulus, do you follow any standard specifications for that? Or does it matter what you mix it? It, it, it's going to follow, the, the, again, another specification. And I've got the sieve sequence right here. But from a calculation standpoint, or at least what I expect of you all, again, it's one of those things where I just want to make sure you know how to do the computations. And again, I'm also playing a little fast and loose with the specs because I want to do the experiments first and then go back and look at them and go, oh, OK, it's not so bad. Because what we might do is we might do our, and I hadn't totally made up my mind, but we might do the aggregate labs, then go back and look at the specs. And once you have a feel for that, then use the specs to do the concrete labs. That's sort of, I think that's sort of my plan right now. In, in practice, yes. Yeah. For, for our purposes, I just want to make sure you can do the experiment and do the lab. So, but yeah, in practice, you're going to follow the spec, you know, to the letter. So, for our purposes, I, we really aren't going to take this concrete and go build a parking garage out of it. So. Or at least, I mean, you, you all can do it. Just don't tell me about it. You know. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions so far? This isn't so bad, is it? Right. I mean, ultimately, the calculations are, are pretty straightforward. You know, I mean, it's not as hard as structural analysis or anything, right? I know y'all can't stand the guy who teaches that class. So <laughs> he's the worst. He's a jerk. You know. I mean, all that. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so um, he, here's looking at, uh, this is what I, I, so like I said, I skipped ahead a little bit in the notes. So ultimately the idea is to take these measurements, you know, a fineness module or a, a, a grain size distribution and compare that against the specification. So, so to skip ahead a little bit, this comes out of an ASTM standard that basically says, here are aggregate grading requirements for concrete. So if you're looking at something like uh, 57 stone, well, 57 stone, size 57 stone, 100% uh, uh, of it has to pass the one and a half inch sieve, 95 to 100% passes the one inch sieve, and so on and so forth. So you would take those uh, distributions and plot it something like this. Now this is fine aggregate, this is coarse aggregate, but this just gives you an idea uh, of where this stuff is coming from. The idea is plot it against the spec and see if your particular uh, aggregate that you're using meets the spec. Okay. Again, if it doesn't, that's where blending comes into play. Okay. And we'll talk about blending definitely next time. We're, we're going to do an aggregate blending example uh, later on. Uh, where we're blending um, two aggregates to meet a given uh, size distribution. So ultimately what we're trying to determine is we've got so much percent aggregate A, so much percent aggregate B, you know, maybe we use 40 and 60 or 70 and 30 and whatnot in order to meet the, uh, the given spec. A um, <coughs> couple other things that, uh, that's worth uh, uh, mentioning, we want to try and eliminate deleterious substances from a given aggregate whenever possible, the stuff that we really don't want to use uh, for most uh, of these types of applications. So we don't want uh, organics uh, whenever possible. We really want to make sure we're not dealing with uh, minus 200 and you know, a fine type materials. This is really more uh, specifically for, for concrete. No clay lumps. Clay is a, uh, uh, and I don't want to breach too much into soil mechanics, but clay is a soil type that's sort of all on its own because unlike gravels and sands and silts, clay uh, is the, really the only soil type that will attract water. So it's its, its own unique uh, uh, snowflake in the, in the uh, soil mechanics world. Clay has a net negative electric charge and it will attract water. So something to, to keep in mind. Um, <coughs> we try and avoid uh, alkaline reactivity. Uh, whenever possible, you know, when we're mixing, we're, we're, um, uh, we've got concrete that are obviously going to be exposed to water during the mixing process, and they're going to be uh, uh, outside. This is something we like to avoid. It's, uh, it's a lot, um, this reaction can be a lot worse in warm climates and in humid climates. This is a, a big deal. Uh, it can be a big deal around here, but we're really talking about like Miami and Orlando and places, uh, places like that. <laughs> so methods, uh, so, you know, if we have problems with this, there are ways we can get around it. We use different types of cements, um, use additional uh, admixtures, things like limestones to reduce uh, alkaline reactivity reactions uh, and what have you. Just a couple things to uh, keep in mind. I'm throwing out some ASTM standards just to give you kind of an idea. Um, there's an ASTM standard, I think, for just about everything. Um, if you've got a concern about a particular aggregate, is, does, uh, uh, are we going to have an alkaline reactivity problem? Are we going to have a problem? There's an ASTM standard to determine that for just about everything, and remediation techniques uh, are, are found uh, as well. Um, okay, I don't want to, right now, I really don't want to talk or get too heavy into asphalt right now. Asphalt something we're going to talk about way down the line near the end of the semester, um, but it is something I do kind of want to mention. Um, uh, hold on for a second, my phone's going off. I do kind of want to mention right now, there are going to be slightly different requirements um, for aggregates when it comes to asphalt applications than it comes to uh, uh, concrete applications. Concrete obviously is uh, going to be one of my main uh, focuses because it's one of the most prevalent civil engineering materials that we use. But things like uh, an aggregate's affinity for asphalt, it's, it's um, determined a little bit differently. Um, you know, for instance, uh, there are other aspects we have to consider, things like freeze-thaw cycles going to be much more important for asphalt concretes. Uh, but again, ASTM standards are present uh, for everything. I'm going to start off with the simple ones in here, and then we might get to the more esoteric ones uh, later. Right now, uh, uh, really what I want to introduce you to, uh, introduce you all to is the concept of aggregate blending. So what I mean by aggregate blending is when we go and do this, 
what happens if the aggregate falls outside the given range and it fails? Well, the idea is, again, if you take an aggregate that's quote unquote too big and take an aggregate that's quote unquote too little um, and throw those aggregates uh, together, uh, you can find an aggregate that meets uh, specification. Now, what, what I'm really interested in your ability to do right now is the uh, ability to blend two aggregates. Um, you can do three aggregates or more. I say it's, 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 uh, it's not possible, but in order to efficiently uh, do calculations with three or more aggregates, you basically have to use uh, some Excel and some like goal seek or solver techniques. Y'all remember that stuff from, from uh, engineering computations. You can set it up and there are ways to do it. I, I actually uh, tossed around the idea of showing you how to blend three or more aggregates, but I really don't think it's, it's um, something that, that really needs to be covered. What needs to be covered is your um, ability to blend two aggregates. Now, um, the first thing I'm going to show you all is how to blend, excuse me, first thing I'm going to show you all is how to blend two aggregates to get a certain gradation. But when you take aggregate A and aggregate B and add them together, you get a new aggregate that has different properties. For instance, if I have this aggregate that has a specific gravity and I have this aggregate that's a specific gravity and I add them together, well, what's the specific gravity of both of them? Is it as simple as just averaging them? Is it a weighted average? Is, it, is there a different way of uh, computing it all together? We got to sort of go through that step by step. So the first thing we'll talk about is gradation, and then we'll talk about how to compute those properties like density and unit weight and specific gravity uh, of a given blend. So let's say that we have two aggregates. Um, so I have aggregate A and aggregate B. Okay. Now what I've got here are the results of a, of a sieve analysis or a grain size distribution. So this is the percent passing, okay? This is the percent passing for aggregate A and this is the percent passing for aggregate B, okay? Now, this is the specification that we've got to meet, okay? This, you know, uh, for this given specification, we have that, you know, for the half inch sieve, 80 to 100 percent has to pass. For the number eight, 35 to 50 percent has to pass. Now, look at, like, here's a perfect example of, of an aggregate that doesn't work on either end. Let's look at the number eight sieve. So for this specification, 35 to 50% has to pass the number eight sieve. Well, aggregate A, only 3% passes. Aggregate B, 82% passes, right? This is a perfect example of one aggregate that's a little too big and one aggregate that's a little too small. So maybe we need to, you know, blend them together, okay? Let me show you how this works. Um, don't worry if this seems a little complicated. We're going to go through this next time uh, together. And I'm probably going to call it after this so that we have time to, uh, if everybody wants to take a break, uh, use the restroom or something like that uh, before lab. But what you'll start out with, you'll start out with a graph that basically has the percent of aggregate A in the blend and the percent of aggregate B in the blend on opposite sides of the chart. So, so the idea is this. So if you draw, let's say, a vertical line like right here that says I've got 30% of aggregate A, so if I'm using 30% of A, it means I've got to use 70% of B. Does everybody see that? So, you, you know, you can't use 30 and 30, it's got to add up to 100. So a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then I've got the aggregate B passing on this side and the aggregate A passing on this side. And this is what uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mitchell asked about. Um, it's all linear and it's a nonlinear curve. This is sort of what I was getting at. So the first thing that you would do is on each axis is you would plot the aggregate gradation. So if I'm looking at aggregate B, you know, go back to the previous slide, what do I have aggregate B? I've got 100, then I've got 96, 82, 51, 36. So 96, 82, 51, 36, you can see that aggregate gradation. Over here, these are the uh, uh, percent passing for aggregate A. And then once you do that, you essentially draw a straight line. So, so Here's kind of the idea. Okay, so let me see if I can identify this real quick. Okay, so number eight, the 2.36. Uh, 2.36, okay, right here. So this, this line right here, this line represents the number eight sieve. And we have, you know, 15 or so percent passing this and we have like 95% passing this. So the idea is, well, what if I just dumped half and half, right? Half of aggregate A and half of aggregate B. The idea is we would linearly interpolate. So we linearly interpolate, and for that number eight sieve, if we blended half and half, we'd probably get about 50 or so percent passing with both. Does that make sense? 
Everybody okay with that? So if for one aggregate, 80% passes, and another aggregate, 60% passes, you put them both together in equal portions, the idea is that 70% would pass with the mixture. Does that make sense? And so we're using linear interpolation. So, you know, we plot the, sieve, uh, the, the percent passing on either end, connect them with straight lines. The next thing that we do is we plot the specification. So these sort of purple dots that you see right here, these are the specifications. That's where this is coming from. Like for the half-inch sieve, it's got to be between 80 and 100. This has got to be between 70 and 90, uh, 50 and 70, uh, et cetera. That's what's going on right here. That's the specification. Connect those with a straight line. And this range right here basically tells us uh, the range uh, for our given specification. And, and, and the nice thing about this approach is graphically it gives us the range that we're able to blend. So what we do is um, here is our specification. What we basically do is we pick the worst case scenario on the left side, the worst case scenario on the right side, and basically anything in between here is a safe blend. So anywhere between 60-some you know, percent of B and 40-some percent of B would be fine. So what we would do is split the difference. For this particular example, it really is half and half. So in other words, if you've got two aggregates that don't meet spec, go through and perform a blending analysis, what we found for this is that if I literally just take half of this and half of that, add them up, it'll meet the specification. What we're going to do is we're going to do an example going through that together next time, and I think you'll kind of see, oh, this isn't so bad. You'll be able to follow it through. It may not be 50%. This particular example, it happened to be exactly 50% uh, down the line. Maybe it's 40 and 60. Maybe it's 30 and 70. We'll figure that out when we go through uh, an, example, uh, an example next time. Uh, I think I'm going to call it there. I don't want to get into information overload, and we're well ahead uh, in terms of time and concept. So I'm actually going to call it right now. I'm going to give everybody a chance to take a quick break. Um, we'll meet back here at 2 o'clock. Meet back here at 2 o'clock and we will do uh, our first aggregate lab. So I'll see you all in a little bit. I need sign-in sheets and I need my aggregate sample. Where'd my aggregate sample go? What's up? In here. We meet in here. Stop my recording.